The main job of that book is to make these documents available to North Americans for whom this story of, uh, of this, this orphan tsunami in 1700 in Japan makes some difference in terms of perception of seismic and of earthquake and tsunami hazard and response to those hazards. You know, what do these documents actually say? So before we put out this book, there was no way that anybody in North America could easily figure out what was in these documents or, for that matter, understand enough of the backstory as to why they were written or how they came to be preserved. Um, the things that, uh, what, what errors arose from copying of some of them. Um, and, they're, they're, and, and how is it that you estimate the, um, from the, da the accounts of damage and flooding in these in these uh, documents. How is it that you estimate tsunami size in Japan so as to come up with an estimate of earthquake size here? So it's the main, the main job of that book is to make these documents accessible. And each of them has all sorts of, uh, of, of, uh, sort of human interest embedded in them. So they, um, I, I'll just, We'll, we'll look briefly at this one. This from, we'll, we'll see this one and also this is from the same volume of, of records of samurai based up in, in here in northeast Japan. The quote I had at, in, in an opening slide came from this, this account about the, the one the, the earthquake being felt. And that was a merchant family on the rise commercially here in uh, 1700. By the time of the American Revolution, this family um, was able to buy the rights to have a family name and carry two swords, something that lowly merchants were uh, uh, were not allowed to do earlier in this in the time of the Tokugawa shoguns. <clears throat> but the, the samurai by then were becoming broke. Um, over here in this lovely script, another merchant uh, writer, this person serving in a hereditary form as a mayor of a castle town, Tanabe, down here. Um, they, their main incentive for this writer is that, is that a branch family of the Tokugawa shogun had a, uh, a warehouse, a rice warehouse, that had been entered by the tsunami. So it was important for this writer to document that fact. Here, here we, uh, number four is something of a police report a rice boat went down carrying 30 tons of rice. Uh, two sailors eventually lost their lives to a storm that sprang up later. The boat tried to get in and out of the, they tried to get into a river mouth port, but the, um, the currents coming in and out um, probably are responsible for setting up what the document calls high waves that prevented in fair weather this boat from coming into the port. Um, there was a nautical accident at, where was it, at Tillamook Bay? Just a few years ago it, that occurred at a time of, of, um, of those, ex those, those extreme low tides that give you the, the very strong uh, uh, sea with the ebb currents. Any of you listen to the Columbia River bar forecasts, you, would, you hear about the, the, high, the high waves that, that are always forecast for for when the, the ebb current out of the Columbia is strong and the incoming swell gets stacked up against the ebb current. So that's, you know, that's, that's probably what happened here. The, the, the local villagers were fearful that they would be, or this is the inference, that, that, that they would be held accountable for, for some loss of the rice somehow. The rice probably just went down with the boat but they wanted to be cleared of any possible responsibility for having stolen any rice. Okay? So they appealed to the local samurai magistrates and probably the captain of the boat had to do something here too because he had insurance claims to deal with. So there are a whole set of, you know, very different reason to create this document. And these are the musings of a village headman down here uh, southwest of, of what's now Tokyo, then Edo. Um, it's a scenic place in the shadow of Mount Fuji, and and his is the most involved of the um, of the participant of the writers in a way. I mean, he's he's there on the scene. He's responsible for the well-being of the of the people in his village. 
Um, he knows about the word tsunami. He's heard it's associated with, with earthquake, but there was no earthquake felt there. He asks the old people in the village, what was this thing? And nobody knows. So it was a very puzzling thing for him. And some, some, somebody else down the line uh, copied this out of an old set of records because they found this was a particularly interesting thing that they wanted to preserve among the many old records that were used to be available for this village. This is just an excerpt. So anyways, we'll go to the, to the northeast here just for this one example. And um, <clears throat> let's see, so some of you, some of you are, are in science professionally and, if, and you, you're in the publisher parish game and you have to, um, uh, you know, when you get your publication, you get so-called reprints of it, right? And then, at least in the old days before PDF files, you'd hand out reprints to people, or you'd even mail the physical copies of the reprints to the people, right? So, so uh, a, f a friend of mine in, in, at the University of Tokyo says that this head is this guy's reprint. Because we give out reprints to show that we know how to do our jobs, right? And his job, his job was to pacify um, uh, up, uh, difficult local people and to institute a system of taxation. And so he was out there to measure, to do land surveys, to assess taxes, uh, to collect taxes, to establish order after what had been a century or two of civil war in Japan. And his mentor in this was one of the unifiers of Japan, a guy named Hideyoshi, who died shortly before 1600. And Hideyoshi's successor was, uh, was, was uh, Tokugawa Ieyasu, the founding Tokugawa shogun. And they ruled, the Tokugawa shogun ruled from about 1600 to the late, eight, late 1860s. They ruled out of Edo, now Tokyo, so that's called the Edo period. And the Edo period is a time of, of prolific production of written records in Japan. So we're fortunate that our most recent tsunami falls a century after the start of the Edo period because by 100 years after the Edo period starts, you know, things are pretty well settled down. And the samurai are busy writing documents like this. So each of these is one year's worth of written records of the, of the um, bureaucracy, the samurai bureaucracy that administered the Nambu family domain, which was up in here. And the one from Genroku 12, if you recall Genroku, uh, Minashigo Genroku Tsunami was the Japanese title of the talk. And so here's the Genroku era showing up on the, title, on the cover of this book. And the 12th year um, was the year of this, that the, the tsunami falls in. It happens to have been a leap leap year, which means it contained 384 days because they operated with a lunar calendar uh, on average 29.5 days per month. And you multiply that out by 12, and I think you get 354. So you've got to add a month every couple of years to keep in sync with the sun. So they did that. So this was a year with 13 months. Um, but anyways, that those those documents were for these Nambu lands in the northeast of Japan. Um, the length of, of this is about equivalent to the length of the Washington coast. This is the coastal side and the inland side here. You can see the piece. And this is the kinder and gentler Nambu who was in charge nominally in, in 1700. And below is a plan view of the castle. Um, those of you near the front can see the castle keep here, and then the secondary structure here was where the is kind of the administrative center. So, when this in the example we'll deal with, there were samurai magistrates in charge of this Miyako district. There were 33 administrative districts, and so it's as if somebody out in Tillamook, you know, sends a sends a letter to Salem or something, and and says, okay, this happened, and. And, and um, it took, I think, six days by courier service uh, for, the, for the, 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 the message to go from Miyako to Morioka, where the samurai scribes in the castle then proceeded to enter into that book of records that we saw. 
So the magistrate's office out in Miyako was like this. The place was important because this Koigasaki was the principal port for the, for the Nambu family lands. And uh, in recognition of that, the, in 1701, they erected a tax office where they, some of you up close can see the little plus sign here. It's a 10% tax office. They collected 10% on imports and exports here. Um, but the, uh, it was part of the same bankruptcy problem that led them to, uh, to, to uh, sell the right to carry two swords and have a family name to the merchant who was just at the south end of Miyako Bay. But anyways, um, uh, Kogasaki had something like 300 houses in it in, in, in around the year 1700. And um, about a tenth of those were destroyed by uh, this orphan tsunami in 1700. 